seminar. Uh, my name is Dale Gifford. I'm with Complex Solutions. I'm a reserve study provider, and I've been asked to come today and do a presentation on reserve studies. Um, so does everybody know what a reserve study is? Everybody knows, has a little bit of knowledge what it is? Okay, good, great. Um, so um, I am a reserve specialist. I'm also a professional reserve analyst and I'm also a professional community manager. I've been in the industry since 2002. Um, I did about half of the time um, managing portfolios, so managing communities just like this one, and or managing managers that were managing about 200 communities. Um, and then I switched over to this, and so um, I've done about 1,700, a little more than 1,700 studies in the Utah area. So, uh, I've done a few. So, let's see if I get this thing working. Did you do daybreak? I have. Yeah, I've done the Daybreak Master Association three or four times now. Uh, I've done every one of the sub associations, I think, at least once. Um, and many of the sub associations I've done two or three times. You just did the recent garden park. I did. I just recently did both the Garden Park uh, Master and the Garden Park Condominium. Yes. Okay, so what is a reserve study? Um, at the very basic, a reserve study is a budget tool. This is an outline for the community to use when creating their budget. You know, you have the operations part of the budget, maybe you have an operational contingency fund, then you have your reserve portion. And so the reserve portion is something that people are less familiar with typically because these are, these are the longer life components such as roofs and roads, boilers, chillers, other mechanical equipment. And so they don't come up as frequently. So you may serve on a board for 20 years and never replace a roof and never have to go through that. And so maybe you don't understand maybe how that works or something. And so this is a tool to help you know not only how long things are going to last but how much they're going to cost when they need to be replaced so why should we have a reserve fund well, for starters it's required by utah code to have a reserve fund okay um, you always want to in any situation have the money available for a project when you need to do the project the last thing you want to do is have a million dollar in roof replacements to do next year and no million dollars to do it. Okay? Yeah? What does the code say about the required reserve? So the code does not require a certain percentage or dollar amount of that stress. What the code says is you have to have a reserve analysis performed. You have to have that every six years. You have to have an update no less than every three years. You have to present it to your homeowners at the annual meeting. You have to have a budget line item in your budget for reserves, and you have to use prudence and the reserve analysis in creating that budget line item for reserves. I don't think in the next five or 10 years we'll see any sort of requirement that says you have to be 10% funded or 20% funded, or you have to have any X amount of dollars. Um, that's not how it's, the industry's really been going in the state of Utah. Um, and there's, there's a lot of pushback when the things like that have been mentioned. They actually were going to write in, I think, 5% to the original law in 2010, and that got struck by the legislature. Um, and 10% is nothing. Um, so they, they wouldn't, or 5% is nothing, so they wouldn't even put in 5%. So um, I don't think we're going to see that requirement. Um, also, every association is very different, and so um, it's kind of hard to have a number or a percentage, and I think that's why they also um, took it out. Um, we want to avoid deferred maintenance, okay? So, yes, we want things to last as long as they will. You know, if we have a, let's say, a boiler system, and that boiler system is supposed to last on average 25 to 30 years, if we get to the 30-year mark and that thing is working fine, and we don't have a ton of extra repairs or a ton of extra call-outs or something that are costing us a lot of money, we don't want to replace it. We want to wait, okay? Um, but on the flip side, what we don't want to do 
I worked with an association who did this. We don't want to pay $50,000 in roof repairs every year for 10 years, and then on the 11th year, pay $500,000 to replace all the roofs. Because then you have deferred and you pay for it twice. We don't want that, okay? We want you to have that money when the project needs completed. And remember, this is, a, this is an outline. This is a guideline for you. And so we're gonna have a lot of useful lives in there and say, hey, the typical asphalt shingle roof is gonna last you 20 to 25 years. But if you get to 25 years and the roofer says, hey, this roof's got three years left, wait three years. You know, if you're not having any leaks, if you don't have any problems like that, then you wanna wait, okay? And that's why it's also important to have those updates because in those updates, we can readjust for that information. We wanna avoid last minute dues increases. So what we want is we want a, a stable fee over time, you know, and a stable fee is always gonna increase because the cost of everything always increases. So it's much better to pay, you know, say $100 a month, maybe for three years, and then maybe $120 a month for the next three years, and to slowly do that over time and say, hey, I know that you're paying $200 a month right now, but we need $500 a month, so we're gonna switch that for you next month. Hope that's okay. So we, we wanna avoid those last minute dues increases. And, and above all, we wanna avoid the special assessments, okay? Special assessments really cause a lot of problems in, in many ways. One, it's very hard on a lot of people. A lot of people, they just don't have the budget fluidity to be able to say, oh yeah, here's an extra 20 grand or an extra five grand or an extra 10 grand. Um, very typically special assessments cause people to have to move or to sell. Some people even get foreclosed on. So we wanna, we wanna avoid that. We want to have those, you know, that steady increase over time, that steady amount over time. So there's types of reserve studies. So we have three different types. This is the industry standard. We have a level one, which is sometimes called the full study with site visit. This is also the initial study. Typically, you will only ever have to have a level one with a company. If you switch companies, they'll probably make you do another level one. Um, now, if you are under development and a lot is changing between studies, you might have to keep doing a level one until you're done being developed, okay? A level two is a reserve study update with the site visit, okay? So, it's an update to an existing study. So, that would be updating like a level one. Or it could be updating a level two, okay? Um, some companies will do a level two based on somebody else's level one. I used to do this. I really don't anymore because what I've found is that I just have to start over anyway because I can't trust their information. Um, because part of what you do in a level two is you are checking to see that the measurements and stuff are correct. So, you know, if they say there's 500,000 square feet of roofing and I come in and measure it and there's 600,000 square feet of roofing, what other number in there is going to be different? So I can't just, I can't trust it is what I found. There was too much inconsistency between how the different reserve providers um, collect the data. Um, and so I just have to start with So it's, it's super, super rare that I'll ever do a level two anymore based on some of this level one. And it's probably super rare that other companies do the same thing. Um, a level three is a reserve study update with no site inspection. Sometimes this is also called a finan financial update. So we do everything we do in a level two. I just don't go to the community and take the pictures and re-look at the condition. I'm changing the useful lives, I'm updating for what was done, I'm updating the financial information, all that stuff. We just don't go out to the community again and take new pictures and evaluate the condition of the components. So the parts of a reserve study. So one of the main parts is the physical analysis. This is where we actually go to the community. We physically look at the components, we measure the components, okay? Um, or count them, as it were. So we evaluate the condition, you know, is there peeling paint? Do we have spalling concrete? Do we have raveling asphalt? Is the fence rusted out? You know, we look at all these things. Um, we evaluate the repair and replacement cost of the components. So we look at what is this gonna cost to replace, you know? 
if you have a fence that you've neglected forever and it's a metal fence and it's all rusted out on all the posts on the bottom and it's barely connected, you probably got to replace it, not repair it. I mean, you could get a bid to go and re-weld in metal to all those posts, but you just got to judge that cost. And then there's a financial analysis component. We assess the association's reserve fund balance. So how much do you have in your reserve fund? How much are you budgeting to put in your reserve fund? What are you planning to do in the next, say, three or four or five years? Um, and then we also look at, you know, what have you done and what did you actually pay to get it done? Um, so this is a common question I get. What is a reserve component? So these are the five questions that we look at as reserve providers when we're trying to determine what the reserve components are. Now, many times it's very easy. We can look at your documents or you already have it laid out. Um, a lot of associations are very similar. They're all different, but they're very similar in what the reserve components are. We're trying to throw a lot of loops now in Utah. We're calling townhomes PUDs, or we're calling condos PUDs, or we're calling townhomes single family homes. And we're doing all this stuff that makes it more confusing, but the documents always tell you, you know, what the association is responsible for. So that's the first thing we look at. What is the association responsible for? If you're not responsible for the streets and the city is, it's not a reserve component. We're not gonna look at it, okay? It has to have a limited useful life. We have to know that this thing is gonna fail. Okay, so we, it's going to need replaced or it's going to need repainted. Um, we need to have a predictable remaining use of life. So we need to be able to predict when that's going to happen. So something like this uh, storm drain system that has, say, a hundred plus year life, you know, is typically not a reserve component because, one, we, it doesn't really have a limited useful life in the sense of a reserve study. Okay, um, it doesn't really have a predictable remaining use of life. We could say, well, hey, it's supposed to last at least 100 years, so we'll just budget for the entire replacement of it in 100 years. But it doesn't really work either because you're not going to replace the whole system. If you have a problem, you're going to dig up one section and fix the problem. Maybe you have a cracked vault or, or something like that. You're going to repair that vault. Um, it has to be above a minimum threshold cost. So this is something I usually start around $1,000. Um, each association is different. I work with some associations where their threshold is anything under twenty thousand dollars to do to other reserve or out of operating. You know, um, I have one that they do everything from operating except for the roofs, so that's their threshold. Their threshold is like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something like that. Um, typically, there's a threshold somewhere in the one to five thousand dollar range, just depending on the size of the community, um, and, and it's pretty much based on how you're actually doing things. Okay. Um, a lot of people don't know how they're actually doing things, so I just started for them. Yes, sir. Where would sprinkler systems fall in? Would that be something that's going to continually repaired or have a so? So that pipe, depending on what type of pipe, has a 50, 75, 100 year life, right? But we don't really know how long it's going to last. We can't predict. So was it bad soil? Is it moving soil? Is it rocky soil? Was it compacted properly? And then again, it's very rare you replace an entire system. So now go back to a community that was built like in the 60s or 50s or maybe even 70s who has a galvanized sprinkler pipe that went from a pipe like this size that's now like this size because of all the, you know, buildup inside of it. And in, in situations like that, they will. They have so many problems, there's no flow. And so they'll just cut the heads off and relay a new system. But that's more rare. These newer PVC systems, um, they last a really long time. And if they have a problem, a leak or something, they dig up that one spot. So typically when it comes with uh, irrigation systems, you replace valves and heads and controllers and you do brakes as an operating expense. And what we do is we'll budget like say every 20 years or something, just a chunk of money and allowance we call it for a larger project to come up. Maybe you have a, an entire section that goes bad for some reason, you gotta replace an entire section, you know? Um, but typically, yeah, it's not a it's not a reserve expense because we're not gonna replace the whole thing. We can't predict how long it's gonna last or when it's gonna fail. Um, and then as required by local codes. We don't have this here. The codes don't tell us what has to be done. Uh, and so we don't really have to worry about that. So some more reserve city contents. 
Um, it also includes an association summary, just basic information, how many units, what type of units, where is it located. Uh, financial projections and recommendations. We put a bunch of graphs in there that say, hey, look, your roofs are 50% of all the money you're gonna spend over the next 30 years, but your sidewalks are only 5%, okay? So all that sort of stuff. To give you an idea of what you should really be paying more attention to, because if something's gonna cost you 50%, I mean, that could be skyrocket if you neglect it. Uh, a component inventory, so we give you an inventory of the components. A lot of times this inventory includes things that aren't reserve components, okay? Maybe the mailboxes are um, the postal service responsibility, but we include them when we put a note, this is not a responsibility of the association because we always get homeowners like, well, what about the mailboxes? Or what about this? Or what about that? And so in those instances, a lot of times we want to have those things in there so that if people have those questions, they can look at the study and have those questions answered. Um, we include sources of information. Where do we get our information? Okay, so typically our information is from the client, uh, you know, from local contractors, actual bids, actual estimates, actual invoices. A description of the level of service. So like we talked about earlier, level one, two, or three, and what we're gonna provide with that level. And then a ton of disclosures that cover everybody's butt. Association summary, I kind of went over that already, skip that. Um, so, financial projections and recommendations. So, the two most important pieces of information we're going to give you in this entire study, which is typically somewhere between 60 and 200 pages long, okay, is the ideal reserve fund balance. This number is what you should already have in your reserve fund, okay? And then the recommended reserve fund contribution. This is what we recommend you put in your reserve fund every month. Now remember, this is a fluid fund. You may put in 20,000 one month, but spend 300,000. That's fine, it's a fluid fund. It's not a rainy day fund. It's not a sit there and build up fund. It's a, we're using it when we need to use it for a reserve items fund. Um, we're also gonna give you kind of a rough barometer of how you stand financially. This percent funded. This is not the overall number that you need to base everything off of. You need to look at the whole health of the community. But we do, yes sir? The uh, recommended reserve fund contribution, is that a theoretical number assuming that you're already at the ideal rate or does that include income? Sorry, get time. So the recommended reserve fund contribution takes where you are currently at and gets, in, in my reports, gets you to 100% funded in 30 years. So it does, it does have makeup built in? Yes, it has makeup built in. It also has inflation built in, and it has interest on investments built in, and so other stuff like that. And when you say your reports, you know, not everybody No, some people, uh, they just either randomly pick a number or let the computer pick a number, and they just give you a report that has a line on it, and it says, do this. And then you say, oh, why, why does your line not go to 100? It goes to like, it looks like 87. Uh, I don't know. Well, who picked 87? Did the association pick it? Did the <laughs> board pick it? Did the management pick it? Did you pick it? I don't know. I've looked at a lot of these reports and I've talked to these people and that's the number their program spits out. And so I don't know why they pick it. There are, uh, we might talk about it here. <laughs> no, I took it out. So there are, um, there are three main philosophies of funding. There's the full funding, which is what we recommend and is what is usually recommended in the industry. How yeah. many associations are out of the That is a great question. So I actually took all the studies I have done and I put them into a spreadsheet and I tra kind of tracked all that stuff. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's less than 10% of all the associations I've done. Um, which is very bad. Um, but you also have to remember, Utah didn't even have a reserve requirement until starting, like it was like July or June of 2010. Um, I still have communities who have just heard about this, air quotes, and who are coming to me, you know, nine, 10 years after the law's been in effect, 
We just heard about it. So um, what I can tell you, it's been getting better over time. Um, you know, a ton of people are less than 50% funded. It's something like 70%. And a ton of people are less than 30% funded. It's like 50%. But over time, it's been slowly going up, which is good because that means fewer special assessments, fewer problems uh, down the road. So 100% um, funded or full funded is one of the three. The second one is a threshold. And what a threshold means is you pick a dollar amount or you pick a percentage that you don't go under. So technically, full funding could be a threshold because you can say we want our threshold to be 100%, but you could say 70% or 50% or 20%. Um, I don't recommend you try to play with the numbers too much. You definitely want to have the money you need when you need it. Um, you don't ever want to go to zero. You probably don't ever want to go probably really below 20%. Um, that way you have that buffer when you have those huge projects. You know, say you do a huge roofing project and they bid to replace the roof and do all that stuff and they tell you the sheeting will be 50 bucks a sheet if we have to replace bad sheeting. Well, what if every single piece of sheeting on every single roof has to be done? That's not part of the bid, that's extra. So what if the bid goes over 20% but you only gave yourself a 5% buffer? You know, so that's why you know we like to have some buffer in there. And then the third, uh, the third uh, funding is baseline. And so as you can probably tell from the word, baseline is stay above zero. So don't ever go below zero. Well, again, what's the problem with writing a zero line? <laughs> the problem is if you have any cost overruns, you're going to dip down below and then you're going to defer maintenance or you're going to have to have a special assessment, you're going to have to do something else. So you want to always make sure you have enough money when you need it. Okay. We're always going to recommend full funding. It's very conservative. It covers our behinds. It covers your behinds. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that with, with so many communities that haven't done any reserve planning, um, except for maybe, maybe in the last 10 years or five years, some people are really far behind. And so it's going to take a while to get there. Um, so, yes, sir. On the other hand, if you're at 100% funding, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be more tempting for HLA and the administrator to want to spend it? For 100%, we got to spend this. No, uh -uh, not at all. What are you going to spend it on? Politicians do it all the time. Yeah, but it's not like that. It's not like that. One, our politi in politics, we're never at 100%. Maybe we're at 100% in Social Security, so they rob it to pay for other things, which they should be jailed for. But it's never truly there. So let's say you live in an association that doesn't have a pool, doesn't have a clubhouse. And let's say you're sitting at 100% funded. Let's say you have $500,000 in there. And you're like, hey, a pool is going to cost us $150,000. And we could build a small clubhouse for three hundred grand. That's four fifty. dollars We have $500,000 just sitting there doing nothing. Let's do this. Let's do this. Well, guess what? It's not a reserve expense, and that money is for reserve expenses only. So you would have to get, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that's called a capital improvement, okay? So you are adding something new. You're not maintaining what is there. And so you would have to go through a different process, and you would have to get all the owners to vote to do that. It's probably going to be like 67 or 75% of the owners to do that. And then you can do something like that, but then let's say you do that and you spend that 500 grand. And five years later, you need to replace the roofs for 500 grand. Doesn't make sense. <coughs> so I'm just not seeing it. Um, the only exception are gonna be associations where say their only component was 10 miles of road and they got the city to take it over or they got the county to take it over. And now they don't have a component and now they have a large chunk of money sitting here doing nothing, then they might spend it on something else because now it's no longer reserve money because they don't have a reserve to take care of. Yes, sir? Well, it could allow you to lower your HOA fees. Yeah, in, a, in that one situation, yes, in that one situation, they would also need to readjust because if their fees were set to maintain that 10 miles of road and now it's no longer their responsibility, they would need to, otherwise they'd be bringing in too much money still. Yep. Yep, exactly. Um, okay, so where are we at? Projected reserve expenses. So what we do is we give you a 30-year list that tells you 
these projects need to be done approximately in this year and they will cost approximately this much okay so like i said roofs are like 25 years siding the hardy board siding you should be painting like every eight to ten years maybe you're painting your doors every eight years you know maybe your asphalt needs some sort of major rehab like an overlay or a rotomill and replace every 30 years maybe you've got to seal your asphalt every five years you know so that's all going to be in that 30 years and that every five year asphalt seal is going to reoccur every five years in there and so that's what this projected expense reserve expenses and the projected yearly reserve fund balance and then we also give you another chart in there that tells you, you know, you're going to bring in this much, you're going to get this much from an interest, you're going to spend this much, and here's what you have left over. Okay? What is, what is the interest? How do you arrive at the interest? Uh, the actual interest rate after taxes that you're getting on your investments. But most people are getting like 0.1%. It's so small. So small. I remember... <laughs> Gosh, like in 2007, the best association I worked with, they had laddered CDs and they were getting like three and a half or four percent. And that same association that had all those ladder C laddered CDs, I actually did their reserve study again like two years ago. And it just blows my mind because they laddered all those CDs and so they're still getting those percentages, you know. And so they're like one of the only associations I work with that's getting something more than like, you know, 0.1% or something, or 1%. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, um, some states do have um, an amount in their state law saying how much their reserve has to be, has to be what percent of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, some states, so I don't know of any state that requires a certain dollar amount or a certain percentage. I know some states have in their wording that you have to have an adequate reserve fund and case law has told us in those states that an adequate reserve fund has been determined to be 70 percent funded or greater is that what you're asking well yeah kind of um, just the fact that that some states do have in, do. in laws that govern um, homeowners associations they do have um, something in there about does not. No. No, I think California point, and Nevada do. At some point, California does. Um, at some point, do I think Utah will? I don't think in the next five or ten years. This state is entirely controlled by mortgage companies, by real estate companies, by bankers, um, and by developers and builders. And all of those people feel that if you put in a requirement, it will hurt home sales, and they don't want to hurt home sales. And they also think that if you put in a requirement, then they will have to budget more, which means people will have to pre-qualify for more because their fees will be initially higher, and that will in turn hurt per home sales. But what we know in the industry is that if everybody is doing those things, then everybody's on a level playing field, so it doesn't matter, and everybody's in a healthier financial position. You'll have fewer special assessments, which means fewer foreclosures, which means fewer lawsuits, because special assessments almost always cause a lawsuit. Um, and then can you imagine, you know, you need $500,000 to do the roof, and then some owner sues you, and you spend $50,000 in court, and now you still need $500,000 for the roofs, and you just wasted $50,000. You know, so, yeah. Okay, so how do we calculate the ideal balance? So remember earlier I told you the two most important pieces of information. Where are In here somewhere. Was the ideal reserve fund balance, okay, and how much you need to save every month. So how do we calculate the ideal balance? Okay, so it's very simple. We look at what is the useful life of the component? So we're gonna use roofs here. Asphalt, shingle roof, a standard asphalt shingle roof, okay? 25 years. And let's say in this community, it's gonna cost them $100,000 to replace their roofs, okay? So they need to save, and this is how the whole report is based, okay? They need to save $4,000 per year in order to have $100,000 in 25 years. So, 
then we look at how old is that roof. Well, it's 10 years old. So if they're supposed to say $4,000 per year and the roof is 10 years old, they should already have $40,000 in their reserve fund. Okay, so this is the ideal balance for this one component. Take all the components together, ideal balance for the entire community, okay? So we take every one of those components, we take what that component should already have in the bank based on per year, and we get that total. And that's where we get the number from. I'll make it up right there. Yes, sir. So that leads me to my, to my question here. When you're talking about your report, you, you break the various capital assets that you're analyzing in terms of what you should have for reserves for. You know, in, in my mind, dealing with kind of a different world, you're talking about depreciable assets and you're funding your depreciation so you can replace them when they wear out. Right? I mean, that's essentially, essentially yes. what we're talking about. Yep. So you're talking here about you're going to have different assets with different useful lives. Correct. You've carved out one, which is an asphalt shingle roof for yep. 25 years. You're also going to have a boiler at 10 years yep. or 15 years, whatever. Will the, and, and, and your report will give us, my, myself, I'm talking about myself here as an HOA board member, I'll be able to see that within these categories, if I'm understanding you correctly, I should be able to break out of that report. Where do we stand in each of these areas in terms of our reserve fund? Is it no. typical that the HOA will no. have broken this out and no. say, well, here's how much we have for the roof, here's no. how much we have absolutely for absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because the main basis of having a full funded reserve plan is that you have a pool of money that is available, okay? So yes, $40,000 in that pool is technically for asphalt shingle roofing. But let's say when you finally get here, let's say there's a cost overrun of 50% because you had to replace all the sheeting and some other weird stuff. And so you really need 60 grand. That's why you have a pool. So you can pull out of the pool. And you also don't want to think about, this This is how like um, schools and towns and stuff budget. They have, they have columns of money that are only allowed for one thing, right? Like, hey, we have a million dollars for books, but we can't feed anybody. Right? And so you don't want to think about it like that. You want to think about it as this is a reserve fund. It's one big pool of money that you're going to use for all reserve items. Okay? So, and another reason you want to be thinking like that is let's say, let's say you have a, a main water line break. Let's say it costs you $20,000. Does your operational contingency fund have $20,000 in it? Let's say it doesn't. Where's it going to come from? Reserves. And you want that pool available. Now, is the water main a reserve item? Yes. Uh, in Utah, um, the law is very vague on what a reserve item can be. Now, typically would a water main system be considered a reserve item we would put in the study and fund at the start? Probably not, because again, we're back to that. Here we got this copper pipe or clay pipe or whatever type of pipe it is and it has a 50 or 75 or 100 plus year of life and we're never going to replace the entire system but we know that somewhere 50 years down the line typically associations start to have some problems with water mains and or sewers and stuff like that and so what we do in those situations is we look at okay hey you had one instance okay you dipped in you paid that one instance but what we need to start looking at is how frequently are we gonna have these instances? Now, typically the associations, if they have one instance, they won't budget it, they won't do anything, okay? And so, then we have a second instance. Let's say we have another $10,000 break the next year. So we start to get a trend, okay? And so at that point in time, I stress with them, you either need to put it in your operating account and budget at least $10,000 every year for water lines, or you need to put it in your reserve study and budget every single year for water lines or you need to have enough operational contingency fund which a lot of associations don't even have any to cover those kind of things but you got to put it somewhere because now you know that this is an expense that's going to start coming up so in that first 50 years we had no expenses sure we could have put it in there and saved money but that's not how the industry works it's a little weird and quirky we go back to those tests of does it have a you know useful life does it have a predictable remaining useful life? And so it fails a bunch of these tests, but once it starts to become a problem, 
we need to budget for it somewhere. And in the state of Utah, you can choose. You can do operating, you can do reserves. Did you just say there's a gray area in there? Always a gray area. Uh, I mean, if you put it in an operational expense when you put it out of reserve, you're going to have to make a decision that it's going to stay a reserve item from then on. Is that what you just said? You can, so in the state of Utah, any reserve item or any operating item can pretty much flip flop places. So they can, you can spend the reserve money on operational items? No. Track? No. Uh, no. So operational items are yearly expenses, maintenance items, and stuff like that. But when it comes to gray area items, such as like a sewer or a water main or something that's not in anywhere it's not anywhere it's not in operating it's not in reserves because it's not a problem and it won't be a problem for so many years okay so it's not anywhere those items there you can choose to pay for it out of operating now you can do the same thing you can take this asphalt shingle roof and you can say hey we're going to budget for our roofs and operating and you could do this four thousand dollars per year every year in your operating fund and run an operating you know, just run a balance in your operating fund that you know is for this. But the problem is that the operating funds tend to get used. Let's say you have a snow year where you spend twenty thousand dollars instead of the five thousand dollars you budgeted. So you spend an extra fifteen thousand dollars in the budget. Well, now are you fifteen thousand dollars short on the roofs when you're going to need to do it? Plus, there's money in there. So, so there's reasons. You want to peel these things out into a reserve component and into a reserve fund so that money's not touched except for these things. And the state law, the, the code, it actually protects it. It says if you have reserve fund money that's earmarked for reserve, that's called reserve fund, you can't use it for anything but other than the reserve fund. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to go back to his comment. Yeah. When I was on our HOA board in California, we understand the laws are different. So we did, I look at the reserve fund as the big picture, yep. but we always knew the components that that big picture was supposed to cover. Yes. So that HOA covered roofs, covered painting, mm -hmm. covered all the common areas, and we it was considered a private street. We had to maintain that ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it, it all under the reserve, but we, when we drill down into those reserves, I hear, I understand, and I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, is that it's one big bucket yeah. pool of money, but we knew all the drops that made up that. Correct. Pool. Correct. So and that's we how these reports are. If we were over yeah. or understanding what our reserve recommended. Well, that yeah. gets to my point. If you gave me a report and you said, all right, you're 50% funded, uh -huh. and you go back to the ideal and say, boy, if you really want to be healthy, you'd like to be. Sure. Seventy or above, one hundred percent. But if you give me a report and say you're fifty percent funded through, but if I look and I say, okay, that fifty percent funding uh, uh, results in X number of millions of dollars, and I look at all those things that are issues that do recur, mm -hmm. shorter useful lives, yep. they're coming up, they're getting to the end, and I'm hundred percent funded on those things. Granted, I know we want to go to the ideal fund, one hundred percent. But as a board member having to make a decision about do we increase fees for homeowners, I'm going to look at that and the pace where we're going to get at that hundred percent sure. a little differently than if you showed me a report where we're fifty percent funded and we're way under on these these shorter items, I'm going to want to get there a lot faster. That's all I was saying. I know it's yeah, all so I actually have a graph in my report and it will show you. Say you're fifty percent funded. So, so you have this five hundred thousand dollars. Let's say it's not going to put fifty percent into every component. Right. What it does is it goes to zero years of life left. One hundred percent funds all those, and it goes to one year of life left. One hundred percent all fund all those, and it starts at zero and goes up, and one hundred percent funds everything that's the lower lives, and then it runs out of money. That's that's great because that yeah. that then gives us something we can yeah. work with in terms yep. of saying. We have justification to say we're exactly. going to pass. Again. Exactly. And so that's a whole other conversation. And that conversation is um, liability. How much liability are you as a board member willing to accept? Because if you knowingly fund things lower because you say, oh, well, in the next five years, we don't need that much. So let's say you knowingly fund things lower and then after that five years and you're not on the board and maybe you need a ton of money and they have to do a special assess or something, 
somebody can come back to you, liability. Hey, you knew you needed more money. You knowingly chose not to fund that. And we're starting to see some of these lawsuits and stuff come in where people are suing the board because, the, to be honest, the board failed in their fiduciary responsibility, which is to properly maintain the association. That's why to I have enough reser- have enough funds, period, to make sure they can pay That's for everything and to maintain property. That's why fiduciary responsibility and all that discussion yeah. needs to be in a minute. Yeah. Be- and that's why it's so important for these brand new communities to start off on the right foot. Because if you start right, it's very easy to maintain over time. But when you come into a community that's 30 years old and they're a million dollars behind, it's very hard to catch up. And most of those associations, you know, we're projecting to get them there in 30 years. You know, we're not projecting to get them there in a year or two years, but in 30 years. And it really depends on you know, what projects they have coming up. A lot of associations I work with, they have a huge project coming up in the next five years, and so they really have to do a special assessment or they have to do a, a wicked dues increase, you know, like say go from 250 a month to like 1250 a month per owner, and then in five years they can drop back down to 250, which is essentially a special assessment, right? Except for they let you pay it over five years. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's much harder to catch up than it is to start right. And so that's why I always I always talk to my, especially the new communities, and I work with a lot of developers too, and I tell the developers, fund them 100%. One, as a developer, you decrease your liability. You decrease your risk of lawsuits because I guarantee you, you leave with 25% funded, they're gonna see you. And you're gonna spend money. And so I've actually been on the phone with developers and they're like, yeah, but a lawsuit's only gonna cost 50 grand and they might win but you saying I have to put $500,000 in there. So then they're doing the same thing, risk analysis. What amount of liability are they willing to accept? But fortunately, most of the developers are understanding the reserves and the budgeting. And so they're getting with me and getting with good management ahead of time to find out what they need to have the fees at so they can start on the right foot. Because if they start on the right foot, they can have all that money there and not have any out of their pocket. You know, they can get it in closing and stuff like that. Yes, sir. So a new development, when does the law require that first reserve study? Um, during the period of declarant control, they are not required to have a reserve study. They are required to maintain the community and leave an adequate amount of money for future maintenance. That's so what the case law has said. According to the law, the developer doesn't have to. So if your developer is doing it before it's been turned over from the period of declarate control, then they're ahead of the ball. They're doing a favor. So you're saying first reserve study after? According to the law, during the period of declarate control, they do not have to have a reserve study. So if the developer is still in control, they don't have to have one. So unless the homeowners at the end of themselves, you get somebody to do it. What is the amount? What is declarative control? 25%, 30%, 50%? It, everyone's 25? different. Everyone's different. Some of them say 75% build out. Some say 50% build out. Some say like 50% build out or, you know, January 1, 2022. Whatever it says in the governing document. And so, so they no, de- developers during their period of control, which is very important, don't have to have a reserve seat, but a lot of them are getting them because they need that information. part of the scam of living in Utah. That's... Builders don't have to do anything. And, and, that's, and that's what the industry and the community association industry in general has to work with, you know? And we're slowly... I'm also a member of the Legislative Action Committee for the Community Associations Institute, and we're slowly working with, you know, legislatures and stuff. Hey, you know, we understand you're concerned on this issue. Let us help you know what is good for the associations with me, what's good for your constituents and stuff. So, so yeah, so, did I answer all the questions? So it sounds like it would make sense for the homeowners themselves to get together. They don't have a power. So done a few months before term. They, don't the they don't have a power to. They could. They could hire me to do that, yeah. and I would do that for them. Um, but much better is for them to conver- c- convince the developer to do it. That way, the developer gets the information, the developer has the information, so they can make an informed choice instead of you coming in as an antagonist against the developer and waving a paper and saying, look, you're doing it wrong, because it's going to be much easier and better if it's them getting the information and making decisions than somebody trying to pressure them. 
So I would work with your developer, work with the management company during the development period to get them to do it. Okay. So that's how we calculate the ideal balance. What else do we have in here? What are we, are we on time? About 10 minutes, okay, perfect. Okay, um, so back to what do we have in the reserve study? Uh, we have a component inventory. So we are gonna have a single page in our study for every component. It's gonna describe the component and the list the quantity of the component. Um, so maybe you have uh, 115 streetlights, okay? So we're gonna say 115 streetlights, we're gonna have some pictures, we're gonna tell you that street light fixture lasts approximately 20 years. We're gonna tell you it's been there for 10 years, so you have 10 years of life left. And then we're gonna tell you currently the replacement cost on a fixture like that is roughly a thousand to two thousand dollars or whatever it is, okay? Where do you where do you get your cost from? Like your estimates from for rooms and Perfect question. Where does Dale get his cost? It is pricing. Okay, so this comes up all the time. I am amazed at how many people think I just make stuff up. They think I make up this, and they think I make up that ideal balance. Well, you just pulled that out there, and I'm like, did you look at the reserve study? It's like, it's math. It's there. So it's, it's, it always floors me. Um, so a lot of reserve study companies use cost estimating guidebooks, okay? You can purchase these cost estimating guidebooks. I could purchase one right now. I think it'll be based off maybe the 2018 year, maybe the 2017 year. And what it will do is it will say, this type of component costs this much, but if you live in this region, this region, this region, this region, this region, apply this adjustment factor, okay? We specifically do not purchase those or use those because they're not as accurate as what we do do, okay? We use actual financial information from the client. Let's say you just painted your community and it cost $100,000. Well, I'm gonna put in there, you just spent $100,000, so the price is $100,000, okay? Or I could go to the guidebook and the guidebook says, well, you should have only spent $85,000. Doesn't make sense to put that in there. Or maybe the guidebook says you should have spent 115. dollars So we're gonna use what actual information we have from the client, okay? Now, a lot of times clients in your community, we don't have any information yet, but I have other clients who have actually just done these things. And so we use actual bids and estimates for Utah jobs, okay? We use actual invoices for Utah jobs, and we use estimates from local companies. So I work with a lot of clients. So people have just replaced their roofs, they've just painted their doors, they've just painted their buildings, they've just replastered their pool, they've just done all these things, and I have all that information and I use that information for other communities. And that's where we get information, the actual money people are spending on the ground in Utah, not what they're spending on the ground in California adjusted to what they think the Utah cost variation is. So okay. how do you then adjust that for your room? You know Sorry. what it costs now. Yes, so we work at an inflation factor. So the, co the building cost index, the average um, inflation increase of the building cost index for the last 20 to 30 years is 3%. So I use 3% because it's a 30 year report. Now, if we look at like 15 years, it drops down to like something like 2.1 or maybe 1.9. And if we look at other smaller variation, it gets all wonky and all over the place. Sometimes it's even negative. And so I'll sometimes get a board member who will argue with me, well, the cost of inflation last year was negative 2% and you have 3%, so that doesn't make sense. I'm like, well, I'm not selling milk or gasoline. So this is what we're doing. Plus that's pretty standard over a long yeah. period of time. Yeah. And they, they also regionally adjust those yep. inflation factors. And you want that because that is helping buffer. Okay. So as we in as we update that study every three years, you know, we update those costs, we update that stuff. And you know, maybe it does take a weird dive and inflation goes way down for a long period of time. Well then we'll adjust it. But until then we're gonna use 3% or roughly 3% because um, that, that's what it's been historically for the 20 to 30 year period. So that's where I get my pricing. Um, we have a reserve study now that we do. Well, you got to determine, like we were kind of talking about earlier, you got to determine what your risk management, what your liability is. 
do you want to be 100%? Is it possible in your community? I mean, if you're doing $100 a month and you need to go to $1,000 a month, you know, it might not be possible in your tenure as a board member. What I always recommend board members do is shoot for 100%. Because the association is always going to bring you back. The members are always going to bring you back because they're not looking at the big picture. Shoot for 100%. Because I get all the, I, all the time I get, well, let's just shoot for 50%. Yeah, if you shoot for 50%, maybe you only get 25. Maybe you only get 10. Shoot for the whole thing. That way, one, you're legally covered when it goes to court, if it goes to court. You can say, Your Honor, hey, we tried to put in this funding to get us to where we need to be. The owner said no. So I don't know why I'm being personally sued because I did my job, okay? So you have to determine what your funding goal is, you know? Maybe you're an association that has no expensive projects and maybe you can ride a 20% line and you don't ever have any dips, really. That's not the average association. The average association, their line goes like this. You know where it goes like this and it goes bam, because they have a million dollar roof project or something, you know? And so you got to determine, and I always, I always advise, Make sure you never go to zero, never. And really, when I build my reports, I look at a ten, at least a 10% buffer, okay, on that on the path to 30 years. Um, but you've got to look as a board and determine what your liability is. We recommend 100%. I'm gonna say it all day long, over and over, okay? Then you've got to determine a course of action. How are we gonna get there? Are we gonna do a dues increase? Probably, because you need some stability over time. Do we need to have an immediate special assessment? Because we got roofs next year and it's $500,000 and we have 100,000. Well, you're probably gonna do a special assessment, okay? And a dues increase. Are we gonna do a loan? What does a loan do? A loan gives you money now and typically you have to have a special assessment to pay back the loan. So let you have a bunch of money now to take care of things and let you pay it back over a longer period of time and you still have to have a special assessment. So if you can do a special assessment without a loan, then you don't have to pay origination fees and interest and all that sort of stuff. But sometimes people are so far behind, they just have to get a loan. They just, they just can't do it. Yes, sir? This is a little bit out of order, but I forgot to ask you before. When you put these reports together and you go through each of the different assets, do you include a line item for contingencies? Like I don't. No. I so don't. You specify everything out, and then you don't have. I specify you every component. Those things that you don't. So I do a best and worst cost, and my best cost is what you actually just spent, and my worst cost is, you, excuse me, usually like maybe ten or twenty percent more. And so there's kind of a contingency worked in on the average of those two, um, but some some reserve study providers they actually put in a component called contingency, which that's not a one. It's not a reserve component. It has no useful life, no predictable remaining useful life. It's not something the associates are responsible for. It fails all the tests, so it shouldn't be in there. But they put that buffer in there. Um, some associations have asked me, and I have. I was like, sure. I had an association that, that had me do that. They put in a buffer because they're still in development and they had some unknowns. Okay. You know, but it's it's typically not something you would do. It's kind of like telling everybody, hey, I don't think my numbers are right, so let's pad them by 25%. I mean, as a, as a professional, why don't I just pad all my numbers 25% and don't put that in there, and then people don't question, why do I have that in there? But I, we just use the cost in, in a range to allow for some variance um, in, in things when you're uh, actually doing the components. Um, so you're gonna determine what your course of action is. Increase, special assessment, loan, all three, okay? Create and adopt a policy as a board. This is in a board meeting, not the homeowners. So the board says, hey, we're $500,000 behind. We need to have this assessment, and then we need to raise the dues to this amount in order to not fall below 20% of the future or whatever amount you choose, okay? I recommend 100%. Um, create that policy, adopt that policy as a board, communicate that policy to the association, okay? If the association wants to push back, they have the right, they have that under the law. Let them do that, okay? You as board members need to cover yourself for your fiduciary responsibility. And that is the best situation or one of the best situations for the association financially. So you're doing multiple things. You're helping yourself, you're helping the association, you're covering yourself. But we all know, I mean, I deal with many, many, many associations that, I mean, 
they're wasting so much money, like say on roof repairs, and they cannot get the owners. Like that, one of the first examples I gave you, they're spending $50,000 a year to repair roofs. They did that for 10 years before I became their manager and said, this is ludicrous. You need to have a special assessment and replace the roofs because you are hemorrhaging money and then at some point in time, you're gonna to have to replace them anyway. And then they finally did, okay? So communicate the policy to the association. Um, and then you gotta go, for, there's a lot of things that can happen after that, but you just gotta push forward from there. You know, hopefully there's not too much resistance. We know there'll be some, if there's not, it's probably Groundhog Day, go back to bed, 